it was a rough few decades for the Strasbourgians. Strasburgers? Strasbourgeois? Strusels? The people of Strasbourg. Welcome to A Popular History of Unpopular Things, a podcast that makes history more fun and accessible. My kind of history is the unpopular stuff. Disease, death, and destruction. I like learning about all things bloody, gross, mysterious, and weird. But you know what? It's time to lighten the mood a bit. I've inadvertently spent way too much time on cannibalism lately. I don't know, it wasn't intentional, really, but it's popped up quite a lot, so instead, I want to talk about dancing. No, really, today's episode is about dance. So, in 1518, an epidemic of choreomania broke out in Strasbourg, part of the Holy Roman Empire at the time, but is now in northeastern France on the Rhine River bordering Germany. Hundreds of residents took to the streets and began to dance uncontrollably for weeks. Several people died from exhaustion. It's been called Dance Mania, St. John's Dance, and more famously, St. Vitus's Dance. And though this incident in Strasbourg is the most famous outbreak, there are records that show it occurred throughout the late medieval and early modern period in various places in Europe. But what could possibly explain why people were wants to break out and dance? Can we explain it away with disease? Possession? Or was there a deeper, more symbolic meaning behind it? So today, let's travel back to the 16th century Strasbourg, that's the 1500s, to understand why people dance to their death in this very historic little town. Today, let's learn about the Dancing Plague. On July 14th, 1518, Frau Trophia walked outside onto the cobblestone streets of Strasbourg and began to dance. Despite there being no music and no reason for the outburst, she danced. And as night fell, she was still there. When her body no longer had the energy to continue, she collapsed. But when she recovered the next morning, she started to dance again. And on that second day, she continued, her movements becoming more erratic and crazed as her arms and legs were sore and fatigued. By the third day, Frau Trophia's feet were bleeding and cracked. People gathered around her to watch, speculating as to why this woman, bleeding and in pain, would not stop dancing. Was she possessed? Was she sick? Was this a message from God? The dancing continued for a few more days, her body getting more bruised and cut up over time, and she was clearly in distress. But by now, others had joined in the dancing. To try and cure this strange disease, they first tried to get them to dance it out. The town built stages, brought in musicians, and thought that by continuing to dance but to music, they would get it out of their systems. But that didn't work. So after six or so days, they brought Frau Trophia and the others who had started dancing with her to a shrine for St. Vitus, high up in the Vosges Mountains, hoping to cure whatever afflicted her, ending the dancing plague. But by then, it had spread, and more and more people took to the streets, to meeting halls, in public spaces, dancing until they passed out from exhaustion, only to pick themselves back up the next morning and continue. By early August, more and more people fell victim to this choreomania, and at least a hundred people were afflicted by an uncontrollable urge to dance. Now, some contemporary accounts, so people that lived in Strasbourg when this event took place, claim that around 400 people were struck with this dancing plague. One account, found in Strasbourg's municipal records, explains that, quote, There's been a strange epidemic lately, going amongst the folk so that many in their madness began dancing, which they kept up day and night without interruption until they fell unconscious. Many have died from it. End quote. So was it an epidemic? It sure looked like one. It started in one woman, then slowly spread to the others around her. Another chronicle claims that during the height of it, 15 people were dying every day dancing in the hot summer sun, especially since they were not stopping to eat, drink, or rest. They just danced, violently, without a stated purpose, but with some kind of intent. 
It ended in early September, two months after it had begun. But why? Why were these people dancing? There has to be a reason that it happened in Strasbourg in 1518, right? Well, if you've listened to some of my podcasts, you know what's coming. It's time to look at the historical context. To get a good sense of what happened with the dancing plague, we need to understand the time period. What is happening in Strasbourg in 1518 that might explain why Frau Trophia walked out into the streets and danced to her death, inspiring hundreds of others to do the same? So let's first dive into the context of what was happening that led to this event, the Dancing Plague of 1518, before we sort through the various explanations for what happened here. Okay, so there was actually a lot going on in the late 15th and early 16th centuries in Europe. Lots of stressors, lots of violence, lots of corruption. But it was also a time when people were becoming more literate, and the printing press was making it easier to disseminate information. I'm going to bounce around a bit by theme here, so I won't go over everything that happened to the people of Strasbourg. I'll try to give you a general sense of what everyday life was like for people, or at least the things going wrong for them. So first, let's talk about disease, my favorite. And I'll begin with my favorite disease, the Black Death. As many people already know, the Black Death was an outbreak of Yersinia pestis, a bacterium that causes buboes to form on an infected person's lymph nodes, the groin, the underarm, and the neck. Make a fist. About the size of your fist is about the size that one of these buboes would get. It would be swollen, painful, black, sometimes purple, and it would be absolutely filled with Yersinia pestis bacteria. Now, it raged throughout Europe from 1347 to 1351, and by the time it was done, an estimated one-third of the population was dead. Now, this left a pretty strong impression on people. Turns out, it wasn't the only plague that was killing people during the quote-unquote Black Death. But that's a story for another episode. My point is that disease in general was wreaking havoc on Europeans who had no real way of understanding why it was happening. And the plague wasn't limited to that one event in the mid-14th century, that's the 1300s. Recurrences of plague were actually pretty common. If you listened to last week's episode on corpse medicine, you learned about the four humors. This is how doctors explained away what ails us. If you are sick or acting erratically, then one of your four humors is off. For more information on that and for a more detailed discussion, go back to the last episode. Now today, we know that antibiotics will cure people who contract the plague. It's a bacterial infection. Easy. But back then? Yikes. Doctors during the Black Death had no real way to cure people suffering from plague, though they certainly tried with things like bloodletting and other wacky, ineffective cures. Plague and other diseases continued to run rampant throughout Europe in the early modern period. This is the period from roughly 1450 to 1750. It's post-Middle Ages but before the industrial technology kicks in. In 1495, an outbreak of syphilis spread throughout Strasbourg. Now, syphilis, kids, is a sexually transmitted infection. Without treatment, which, by the way, is taking the correct course of antibiotics prescribed to you from a reputable doctor, a person who contracts syphilis can die from organ failure. Now, it takes a long time to kill you, but it's still potentially fatal. Also, please consider that the early modern period is not the most sanitary of times, so you also need to factor in the general dirtiness of streets, homes, waterways, etc. For more information on how modern sewer systems were invented to curtail this poopy pollution, go listen to my episode on the London cholera epidemic. Now, though contemporary doctors didn't know much about microbes and bacteria, they did know that syphilis was contracted through sex. So those who suffered from it were labeled as adulterers and fornicators. Most people believed that God must be angry with their sinful actions, so they get syphilis as a punishment. In 1502, another bout of plague struck Strasbourg, and though it wasn't as deadly as the famed Black Death outbreak from about 150 years prior, it still claimed some lives and caused panic. In 1518, another short plague outbreak. In 1517, a smallpox outbreak. For those of you unfamiliar with this one, you can thank modern science for that. 
Smallpox is a viral infection that can spread very easily, and it's been around since settled human civilization. Basically, ever since we cohabited with our livestock, allowing our gross human viruses to mutate with animal strains. It's the disease that Europeans brought over to the Americas, starting with Columbus's voyage in 1492. It's the one that wiped out anywhere from 50 to 80% of all indigenous peoples, helping the Europeans to conquer and colonize. And smallpox continued to be a blight on our species until we eradicated it in 1980. That means we vaccinated enough people around the world so that the virus could no longer spread. And for those of you who didn't listen to the cholera episode, a virus needs a host to survive. So if there were no available hosts, because they've all been vaccinated, then poof, no smallpox. There have been zero cases of smallpox since 1980. Go science! But anyway, it was certainly still around in 1517, and it killed a bunch of people. Now, in the same year, as people were weakened by malnutrition, more on that later, leprosy started to pop up too. Leprosy is caused by a specific type of bacteria, by the way, and can be cured if caught early. But back in the day, since leprosy was highly contagious, people who contracted it were isolated from their community and sent to leper colonies. And then, same year, a disease rolled into town called the English Sweat. People would go manic, start sweating profusely, and die very quickly. We're not 100% sure what this was, as it was isolated to a very short period of time, but it was likely a form of hantavirus, a virus that you can pick up from rats, their bites, their stool, or urine. So, as I mentioned in the opening, the event in question happened only a year later in 1518. It was a rough few decades for the Strasbourgians. Strasburgers? Strasbourgeois? Schussels? The people of Strasbourg. So, how did everyone respond to all of this bad luck? These outbreaks of deadly diseases? Well, they believed that God was angry with them. Now, we can actually trace this idea back to the Black Death. It was hard for people to rationalize what was happening to them. One day, everyone was fine, and the next, people were dropping dead from a mysterious illness. They didn't have scientific explanations for what was happening, only religious ones, and the people of the medieval and early modern periods were intensely religious. Here's a contemporary source about the Black Death, someone living and witnessing firsthand the devastating effects of plague on Italy. It comes from a man named Gabriel de Musi, a historian and town chronicler. Quote, I am overwhelmed. I can't go on. Everywhere one turns, there is death and bitterness to be described. The hand of the Almighty strikes repeatedly to greater and greater effect. The terrible judgment gains in power as time goes by. What shall we do? Kind Jesus, receive the souls of the dead, avert your gaze from our sins, and blot out our iniquities. We know that whatever we suffer is the just reward of our sins. Now therefore, when the Lord is enraged, embrace acts of penance so that you do not stray from the right path and perish. End quote. This short excerpt gives us a lot of information. The author says that the hand of the Almighty struck them with the plague that he wants Jesus to avert his eyes from the sins of mankind, and he further implores his fellow man to be penitent, so that God will no longer be angry with their sins and stop punishing them with the plague. Interesting. So, without a better idea of what was happening to them, many believed that God was angry, and in his wrath, sent the plague down to punish the sinners. And if that's what a majority of people in 1518 Strasbourg believed as well, then who boy, they must have been sinning big time after the waves upon waves of diseases that they were dealing with. Now, in addition to disease, the people of Strasbourg were suffering from crop failures and famine, particularly in the years preceding Frau Trophia and her dance mania. In one year, there was a drought, and all the crops dried up. Another year, there was too much moisture, and the crops all rotted in the fields. There was less and less food available, so people started to starve. And all of this malnutrition also caused significant death, and people were getting sick of it. Literally. As is what happens during times of social and economic difficulties, there were rebellions. 
The most famous in the early 16th century, that's the 1500s, were organized by a peasant named Joss Fritz, though there were many others. And they were generally not successful. But their existence tells historians like us that there was clearly a social problem here. It was bad enough that people were succumbing to illnesses, dying from starvation, and were afraid their god was mad at them. But peasant rebellions often point to another issue, political inequality and or corruption. Something was stirring people up. And shocker, it was corruption. It was barely a secret at this point that monks, nuns, and clergymen were not living the life they were supposed to live. Nuns were having liaisons with men in the cloisters of their monasteries, and monks were profiting off of people and consuming things like good salted meat, fine wines, and more. Basically, they were living the good life. Now, did every monk and nun do this? No. But the Catholic Church had clearly lost its way, and some of its clergy members were very corrupt. Some church officials had been charging their flock money to get into heaven, indulgences, they were called, promises from the Pope that if they paid enough money to the church, they were guaranteed a spot. Yeah, that's, that's not how that works. Now, the printing press was brought to Europe in the mid-15th century, that's the 1400s, by Johann Gutenberg. I hesitate to use the word invented because it was first a Korean device, then adapted by the Chinese, and now adapted by the Europeans. And what Gutenberg's printing press did was begin the print revolution for Europe. Books, pamphlets, you name it, were printed and distributed throughout the continent. And it wasn't just in the fancy language of the elites, either. Books like the Bible were printed in the vernacular, which means the local languages that the people actually spoke. So, for the people of Strasbourg, things were printed in German. Now, over time, this had the result of increased literacy. As more and more people became literate, they read what many considered to be the most important book, the Bible. And as they did this, they came to see that there were many inconsistencies in what the Bible said and what their local clergymen were doing. Long story short, disagreements over religious ideas, God, the Bible, and more came to a head with Martin Luther a German monk who was widely held responsible for starting the Protestant Reformation in 1517, one year before our dancing plague in Strasbourg, which is only 310 miles, or 500 kilometers, away. For the people of Strasbourg, who were already suffering from a myriad of diseases, crop failures, corrupt religious figures, and more, let's just say that it was a time of extreme uncertainty. But wait, there's more. Because not only was there a looming religious conflict ahead of them, with people questioning their faith, but there were also tons of invasions happening as well. Now back in 1453, the large commercial Christian city of Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks. It was renamed Istanbul, became a large hub of the Ottoman Empire, and a base for the Turks to continue to invade Europe. If you listen to episode 3 on the Blood Countess, Elizabeth Bathory, I mentioned the constant looming threat of the Turks. Her husband had spent a lifetime fighting them and taught her some of his torture methods, which she then used to kill her servants. These conflicts between Turks and Europeans didn't really end until the mid-19th century, that's the 1800s, and they were certainly a daily concern back in the 1500s. So not only were people worried about God hating them, about their sins, about the growing sins of their clergymen, about peasant rebellions, and about crop failures, but now they're worried about the Turks. And what did that say of them? That God would allow the Turks to conquer a Christian city. These were concerns that a lot of Europeans had. And on top of all of that, rival European powers were also at war, not just country to country, but also region to region, especially in the Holy Roman Empire, where rival princes fought over land and religious beliefs. Though the worst of these religious wars were yet to come. From 1618 to 1648, the Germanic princes of the Holy Roman Empire fought each other over their religious beliefs in the Thirty Years' War, which ended when they signed the Treaty of Westphalia, allowing each prince to choose whatever religion his people would follow. The Holy Roman Empire became a patchwork of Catholic and Protestant faiths. So, in short, there is a lot going on in Europe, and more locally in Strasbourg, in the years leading up to the Dancing Plague of 1518. And Frau Trophia and the dancers that joined her grew up in all of that chaos, uncertainty, and fear. 
So in mid-July, Frau Trofeo went outside her home and started to dance. To us in the 21st century, this may seem like a weird way to process fear, but it wasn't all that strange for her world. In fact, though the Strasbourg dancing plague gets the most attention, there are several other instances of dance outbreaks on record. In 1017, a Saxon town priest saw some people dancing in a graveyard, thought it disrespectful, and cursed them all to dance without end for a year. In a Welsh church in 1188, people danced during a ceremony but fell to the ground in a trance-like state, writhing and moving strangely. In the German town of Erfurt in 1247, a hundred-plus kids started to dance out of nowhere, hopping their way out of town. In Maastricht, 1278, 200 people started dancing out of nowhere on a bridge. 1374 in the Rhineland, pilgrims danced from town to town, hitting up holy sites along the way. The flagellants used to do this as a form of repentance, whipping themselves with spiked flails as they went, trying to curry God's favor. So these pilgrims were just dancing, though. And I said flagellants, by the way, not flatulence. No farts involved. In 1418, women started dancing in a church, unable to stop. 1442, a monk in the Swiss town of Schaffhausen, probably said that wrong, Schaffhausen? Schaffhausen, danced himself to death in the monastery. 1452, a man at a church in Zurich started dancing uncontrollably, asking a nearby armorer to help him end the misery. And in 1463, more written testimony of pilgrims dancing while visiting holy sites. There were also plenty of records of dancing outbreaks post-1518. So, what are we to make of this? Clearly, there is a historical record of people dancing in conjunction with religion, or perhaps just in general, in response to something. There's nothing in the records to suggest this was an outrageous act, or one caused by disease. The Strasbourg event we're covering today became so widely known, probably because of the number of deaths, but definitely because of the popularity of the printing press. It was easier to disseminate information, which means more people were writing and speculating on things, publishing their ideas. Here's another contemporary source, written by an academic named Sebastian Brandt, who lived in Strasbourg at the time of the outbreak. Quote, A dance erupted among the young and the old, dancing all day and night until they fell down, with more than 100 dancing in Strasbourg at one time. The guild hall of the carpenters and dyers was reserved, and platforms in the horse market and grain market were erected, while people who were paid to stay and dance with them played the fife and drum, and the dancing continued. The dancers were then sent by wagon to the Vitus shrine beyond Severn, whereupon they collapsed at the sight of the saint's image. The stricken were given a mass, the sign of the cross was made in St. Vitus's name, The priest rubbed holy oil on the tops and bottoms of red shoes in St. Vitus' name, and this made them well again. And this is why it is called the St. Vitus Dance. End quote. So, when we look back on this, we have to understand that dancing was not an unusual reaction to things, and based on the evidence, it was often tied to at least religion. It also seems that it was usually peasants doing the dancing. There are not extensive records of noblemen doing this, So we have to assume, then, that the lower classes are reacting to something. Is it divine expression? Social inequality? Fear? Now, contemporary figures came up with all sorts of reasons, like demonic possession or witchcraft, both concerning topics of the day. The Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer of Witches, written in 1496 by witch hunters, asserted that, quote, witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which in women is insatiable. So was Frau Trophia displaying witchcraft? Was she possessed, trying to convert the people of Strasbourg to her devilish ways using dance? It's what some people believed. There was a legitimate panic that witches and the devil were trying to ruin society, only bolstered by the string of diseases, crop failures, and constant invasions. But soon after, that theory was replaced with its opposite. It wasn't Satan here, but God. Her dancing was a message. Perhaps people looked at her as suffering some kind of divine punishment? The general consensus was that it was a vengeful saint punishing Frau Trophia and the others, St. Vitus. And so she was forced to suffer from St. Vitus's dance, which only ended when she was brought to his shrine in the mountains. Now, over the years, more modern historians have sought more reasonable explanations. 
Just like when historians tried to pin down the root cause of the Salem witch trials, there are some over the years who have blamed ergot poisoning. For those of you who haven't listened to the Salem episode yet, ergot poisoning comes from eating a fungus that infects certain cereal crops like rye, wheat, or barley. It's toxic and causes either convulsive or gangrenous symptoms, sometimes both. Someone suffering from ergot poisoning can display seizures, psychosis, loss of feelings in the extremities, and then the usual set of physiological responses to disease like headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, etc. And while someone suffering from ergotism may experience random spasms that could mirror dancing, it doesn't impact everyone who comes in contact with it, and it doesn't impact people the same way. It just doesn't explain away the dancing, or how many people got involved. The sources make it clear that Frau Trophia and her compatriots were dancing, not spasming, so ergot poisoning is out. Then came those who believed it was just hysterics. Something that actually mirrors a contemporary opinion of the time given by none other than Mr. Corpse Medicine himself, Paracelsus. For those of you who listened to my previous episode on corpse medicine, you may remember Paracelsus as the humorist physician who came up with exceptionally strange cures for various ailments. He was traveling near Strasbourg in this period of time and wrote extensively on what he thought was happening with Frau Trophia and this choreomania that took the town by storm. Here's what he wrote on the subject. Quote, Shut the patients into a dark, unpleasant place and let them fast on water and bread for some time without mercy. This hunger will compel them to adopt a different nature and different thoughts so that the lasciviousness is driven out by abstinence. Some think they would die if they could not act in such a way, singing, dancing, etc., but it is not so. It is better to take a good stick and give the patients a good beating and lock them in. End quote. So, faking it, basically. He thought they were being annoying, misbehaving peasants and ought to be beaten into submission. He certainly thought that Frau Trophia was just being impetuous, trying to embarrass her husband for some reason. But I remind everyone that this is the guy who encouraged people to grind up and consume the skull of a recently hanged man to imbibe his essence and grow stronger. So, you know, things were different back then. Now, later historians, after ruling out ergotism, blamed it on mass hysteria, the idea that people suffering from immense anxiety will disassociate and that will spread contagiously so that people will collectively react to stressors. It starts with one, spreads to another, and people will act out because of the immense stress and anxiety placed upon them. And it can manifest itself differently as well. For Frau Trophia and for others who were suffering from the immense pressures, violence, and chaos of the times, they broke down and danced. A practice common to the lower classes as a way of getting out their anxieties and nervous energy. Does this help explain it? Possibly. By 1518, people had lost faith in the church and its ability to save them from what they perceived as God's wrath in many forms. Epidemic disease, crop failures, corrupt clergymen, Muslim invasions from the south, and budding religious wars between rival European states. But I think labeling this just as an instance of mass hysteria takes away the peasants' agency, meaning we're not looking at them as players in the game. It assumes they were afflicted and had no power over what they were doing, simply victims to what afflictions were levied upon them. It's never good to victimize people in this way, because it removes their agency, their ability to make their own decisions. No, Frau Trophia was not a poor woman who had no control over what she was doing. What better explains this situation is that Frau Trophia and the others, in their own way, were protesting against the hardships of the time. They weren't capable of rebelling, like Joss Fritz, but they were capable of causing a scene through dance, making a point, whether they were conscious of it or not. Was this a purposeful protest against how bad things were getting? Maybe. Was it a subconscious reaction to the fear and chaos of the times? Were they suffering from some kind of mass psychogenic illness? possibly. But regardless of whether or not they were in a trance and did this in a stress-induced mental break, or if they were doing this as a form of purposeful protest, there's no denying it shocked the onlookers. I mean, it's 2023 and people are still talking about this one event. So why dance, though? If the people were experiencing mass hysteria, or even if they were subconsciously protesting against social ills, why did it manifest itself through dance? Well, 
Dancing is as old as human civilization. To dance is part of the human experience, and dancing as a religious custom has been around for a long time. And it's not gone, either. There are many denominations of Christianity where churchgoers are encouraged to break out and dance when the mood strikes. During the medieval period, dance was incorporated into Christian ritual. It was even rumored that the famed Francis of Assisi danced while he was preaching in the late 13th century, that's the 1200s. The clergy and their congregation would dance in church during public worship, especially during Christmas and Easter. And in Strasbourg, there was a nearby shrine to St. Vitus, a saint that Europeans believed would curse people to dance. So when Frau Trophia began dancing, likely in a stress-induced incident of mass hysteria, it manifested itself through this local saint. Thanks for joining me for this episode of A Popular History of Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of the dancing plague. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't already checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. For more weird European medical stuff, check out episode 12 on corpse medicine. As in medicine made from corpses. For Europeans dealing with other diseases but in the industrial age, check out episode 8 on the London cholera epidemic. Follow my podcast wherever you listen so you know when new episodes are dropped. And stay tuned for my next one to get a popular history of unpopular things.